CPC Section 10 11 Doctrine of Rest Chap Judis Section 10 Doctrine of Rest Judicata Section 11 Section 10 deals with stay of civil suits. It provides that no court shall proceed with the trial of any suit in which the matter in issue is also directly and substantially in issue in a previously instituted suit between the same parties and that the court in which the previous suit is pending is competent to grant the relief claimed. Section 11, on the other hand, relates to a matter already adjudicated upon. <laughs> it bars the trial of a suit or an issue in which the matter directly and substantially in issue has already been adjudicated upon in a previous suit. Rest subject is stay of suit, section 10. Section 10 reads thus, No court shall proceed with the trial of any suit in which the matter in issue is also directly and substantially in issue in a previously instituted suit between the same parties or between parties under whom they or any of them claim litigating under the same title where such suit is pending in the same or any other court in India having jurisdiction to grant the relief claimed or in any court beyond the limits of India established or constituted by the central government and having like jurisdiction or before the Supreme Court. Nature and Scope Section 10 declares that no court should proceed with the trial of any suit in which the matter in issue is directly and substantially in issue in a previously instituted suit between the same parties and the court before which the previously instituted suit is pending is competent to grant the relief sought. The rule applies to trial of a suit and not the institution thereof. It also does not preclude a court from passing interim orders such as grant of injunction. Section 11. Section 11 of the Code of CPC reads thus, No court shall try any suit or issue in which the matter directly and substantially in issue has been directly and substantially in issue in a former suit between the same parties or between parties under whom they or any of them claim litigating under the same title. In a court competent to try such subsequent suit or the suit in which such issue has been subsequently raised and has been heard and finally decided by such court. Explanation 1. The expression former suit shall denote a suit which has been decided prior to the suit in question, whether or not it was instituted prior thereto. Explanation 2. For the purpose of this section, the competence of the court shall be determined irrespective of any provisions as to the right of appeal from the decision of such court. Explanation 3. The matter above referred to must in the former suit have been alleged by one party and either denied or admitted expressly or impliedly by the other. Explanation 4. Any matter which might and ought to have been made ground of defence or attack in such former suit shall be deemed to have been a matter directly and substantially in issue in such a suit. Explanation 5. Any relief claimed in the plaint which is not expressly granted by the decree shall for the purpose of this section be deemed to have been refused. Explanation 6. Where persons litigate bona fide in respect of a public right or a private right claimed in common for themselves and others, all persons interested in such a right shall, for the purpose of this section, be deemed to claim under the person so litigating. Explanation 7. The provisions of this section shall apply to a proceeding or execution of a decree and reference in this section to any suit, issue or former suit shall be construed as references, respectively to a proceeding for the execution of the decree, question arising in such proceeding and a former proceeding for the execution of that decree. Explanation 8. An issue heard and finally decided by a court of limited jurisdiction competent to decide such issue shall operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit, notwithstanding that such court of limited jurisdiction was not competent to try such subsequent suit in which such issue has been subsequently raised. The doctrine of res judicata is conceived in the larger public interest which requires that all litigation must sooner than later come to an end. The principle is also founded on justice, equity and good conscience which require that a party who has once succeeded on an issue should not be harassed by multiplicity of proceedings involving the same issue. Section 11 of the court contains in a statutory form what the illuminating explanations very salutary principle of public policy. It embodies the rule of conclusiveness and operates as a bar to try the same issue once again and thereby avoids vexatious litigation. Object. The doctrine of res judicata is based on three maxims. Nemo debit bis vexari pro una et idem causa. No man should be vexed twice for the same cause. Interest republicae ut sit finis litium. It is in the interest of the state that there should be an end to litigation. And res judicata pro veritate occipitur. A judicial decision must be accepted as correct. The rule of res judicata, while founded on account of precedent, is dictated by wisdom, which is for all times. 
Dr. Navaraj Jodhikata is the combined result of public policy reflected in maximums B and C. That is, interest per public A would set finish lithium and the Jodhikata probability at Occipitor. And the private justice expressed in maxim A, that is, Nemo debit with Vexari, pro una et idem causa. And they apply to all judicial proceedings, whether civil or criminal. But for this rule, there would be no end to litigation and no security for any person. The rights of persons would be involved in endless confusion and great injustice done under the cover of law. The principle is founded on justice, equity and good conscience. The leading case on the doctrine of res judicata is the Duchess of Kingston case, wherein Sir Williams D. Gray made the following remarkable observation. From the variety of cases relative to judgments being given in evidence in all civil suits, these two directions seem to follow as generally true. Firstly, the judgment of a court of concurrent jurisdiction directly upon the point is as a plea, a bar, or as evidence conclusive between the same parties upon the same matter directly in question in another court. Secondly, that the judgment of a court of exclusive jurisdiction directly on the point is, in like manner, conclusive upon the same matter between the same parties coming incidentally in question in another court for a different purpose. In corpus system of jurisprudence and is put unto in corpus juris also it has been stated res judicata is a rule of universal law pervading every well-regulated system of jurisprudence and is put upon two grounds, embodied in various maxims of the common law. The one public policy and necessity which makes it in the interest of the state that there should be an end to litigation. The other, the hardship to the individual that he should not be vexed twice for the same cause. Illustrations. Let us consider a few illustrations to understand the doctrine of res judicata. A sues B for damages for breach of contract. The suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit by A against B for damages for breach of the same contract is barred. A's right to claim damages from B for breach of contract having been decided in the previous suit, it becomes res judicata and cannot therefore be tried in subsequent suit. B cannot be vexed twice over the same cause, breach of contract. Moreover, public policy also requires that there should be an end to a litigation and for that reason, the previous decision must be accepted as correct, lest every decision would be challenged on the ground that it was an erroneous decision and there would be no finality. A sues B for possession of certain properties on the basis of a sale deed in his favour. B impugns the deed as fictitious, the plea is upheld and the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit for some other properties on the basis of the same sale deed is barred as the issue about the fictitious nature of the sale deed was actually an issue in the former suit directly and substantially. A sues B, C and D. In order to decide the claim of A, the court has to interpret a will. The decision regarding the construction of the will on the rival claims of the defendants will operate as res judicata in any subsequent suit by any of the defendants against the rest. Next, A files a petition in High Court under Article 226 of the Constitution for reinstatement of service and consequential benefits contending that an order of dismissal passed against him is illegal. The petition is dismissed. A cannot thereafter file a fresh petition in the Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution nor can institute a suit in a civil court as such petition or a suit would be barred by res judicata. Next, A sues B for possession of certain property alleging that it has come to his share on partition of joint family property, B's contention that the partition has not taken place is upheld by the court and the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit by A against B for partition of joint family property is not barred. Next, A claiming himself to be the owner of property files a suit for eviction of tenant B and subtenant C which is decreed ex parte by a small causes court. C then files a suit in the civil court on the basis of title. A pleaded res judicata in the light of the decree passed in formal suit. The finding regarding ownership A will not operate as res judicata in as much as the title to the property was not directly and substantially an issue in the former suit. Next, A, a partnership firm filed a suit against B to recover 50,000. Suit was dismissed on the ground that it was not maintainable since the partnership was not registered as required in the provisions of Indian Partnership Act. Firm was thereafter registered and the fresh suit was filed against B on the same cause of action. The suit is not barred by res judicata. A files a petition in a High Court under 226 of Constitution for reinstatement in service and consequential benefits contending that an order of dismissal passed against him is illegal. The petition is dismissed on the ground when the disputed question of fact are involved in the petition and an alternate remedy is available to the petitioner. A suit is a complete competent com uh, civil court after dismissal of petition is not barred by res judicata. History. The rule of res judicata has a very ancient history. It was well understood by Hindu lawyers and Mohammedan jurists. It was known to ancient Hindu law as Puru Nyaya, former judgment under Roman law 
it was recognized that one suit and one decision was enough for any single dispute the doctrine was accepted in the european continent and in the commonwealth countries at times the rules worked harshly on individuals for instance when the former decision was obviously erroneous but its working was justified in the greater principle of public policy which required that there must be an end to every litigation in the event of a wrong decision the suffering citizen must appeal to the lawgiver and not to the lawyer extent and applicability the doctrine of res judicata is a fundamental concept based on public policy and private interest it is conceived in the larger public interest which requires that every litigation must come to an end it therefore applies to civil suits execution proceedings arbitration proceedings taxation matters industrial adjudication writ petitions administrative orders interim orders and criminal proceedings res judicata and rule of law the doctrine of res judicata is of universal application in the historical decision of dario versus state of up The Supreme Court has placed the doctrine of res judicata on a still broader foundation. In that case, the petitioners had filed a writ petition in the High Court of Allahabad under Article 226 of the Constitution, and they were dismissed. Thereafter, they filed substantive petitions in the Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution for the same relief and on the same grounds. The respondents raised the preliminary objection regarding maintainability of the petition by contending that the prior decision of the High Court would operate as res judicata to a petition under Article 32. The Supreme Court upheld the contention and dismissed now Delhi Dakarna. Dismissed the petition. Speaking for Constitution Bench, Gajendra Gatkar J. observed the binding character of judgments pronounced by courts of competent jurisdiction is itself an essential part of the rule of law, and the rule of law obviously is on the basis of administration of justice in which the Constitution lays so much emphasis. The court, in this view of the matter, held that the rule of res judicata applies also to a petition filed under Article 32 of the Constitution, and if a petition filed by a petitioner in High Court under 226 of the Constitution is dismissed on merits, such a decision would operate as res judicata as to bar a similar petition in Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution. Next, res judicata and res sub judice. The doctrine of res judicata differs from res sub judice in two aspects. Whereas res judicata applies to a matter adjudicated upon, res judicatum. Res sub judice applies to a matter pending trial sub judice, and res judicata bars the trial of a suit or an issue or an issue which has been decided in a former suit. Res sub judice bars the trial of a suit which is pending decision in a previously instituted suit. Res judicata and estoppel. The doctrine of res judicata is often treated as a branch of the law of estoppel. Res judicata is really estoppel by verdict or estoppel by judgment. The rule of construction, res judicata, is nothing else but a rule of estoppel. Even then, the doctrine of res judicata differs in essential particulars from the doctrine of estoppel. Whereas res judicata results from a decision of the court, estoppel flows from act of parties. The rule of res judicata is based on public policy, namely there should be an end to litigation. Estoppel, on the other hand, proceeds upon the doctrine of equity that he who by his conduct has induced another to alter his position to his disadvantage cannot turn around and take advantage of such alteration of the other's position. In other words, while res judicata bars multiplicity of suits, estoppel prevents multiplicity of representations. Res judicata asks the jurisdiction of a court to try a case and precludes an inquiry in in limine. And the threshold estoppel is only a rule of evidence and shuts the mouth of a party. Res judicata prohibits a man averring the same thing twice in successive litigation, while estoppel prevents him from saying one thing at one time and opposite at another. Rule of res judicata presumes conclusively the truth of the decision in the former suit, while the rule of estoppel prevents a party from denying what he has once been called the truth. In other words, while res judicata binds both the parties to a litigation, estoppel binds only that party who made previous statement or showed the previous conduct. Res judicata and stare decisis. Res judicata means a thing adjudicated, a case already decided, or a matter <coughs> settled by decision or judgment. Stare decisis means to stand by decided cases, to uphold precedents, to maintain former adjudication, or not to disturb settled law. Those things which have so far been adjudged ought to rest in peace. Res judicata and stare decisis are members of the same family. Both relate to adjudication of matters. Both deal with final determination of a contested questions and have the binding effect in future litigation. Both doctrines are the result of decision of a competent court of law and based on public policy. There is, however, a distinction between the two. Whereas res judicata is based upon conclusiveness of judgment, adjudication of prior findings, stare decisis rests on legal principles. Res judicata binds parties and privies, while stare decisis operates between strong strangers also, and binds courts from taking a contrary view on the point of law already decided. Res judicata relates to a specific controversy. Stare decisis touches legal principles. Res judicata presupposes judicial finding upon the same facts as involved in subsequent litigation between the same parties. Stare decisis applies to same principle of law to all parties. 
Residue data and splitting of claims. The doctrine of residue data also differs from Order 2, Rule 2 of the Code. Firstly, the former refers to a plaintiff's duty to bring forward all the grounds of attack in support of his claim, while the latter only requires the plaintiff to claim all reliefs flowing from the same cause of action. Secondly, while the former rule refers to both the parties, plaintiff as well as defendant, and precludes the suit as well as the defense, the latter refers only to a plaintiff and bars the suit. Residue data whether technical. No doubt the rule of residue data has some technical aspects. For instance, rule of constructive residue data is really technical in nature. Similarly, pecuniary or subject wise competence of the earlier forum to adjudicate the subject matter or grant reliefs sought in subsequent litigation can be said to be technical. But the principle on which the doctrine is founded rests on public policy and public interest. Order 2, Rule 2, which prohibits splitting of claims, reads as under every suit shall include the whole of the claim which the plaintiff is entitled to make in respect of a cause of action. But the plaintiff may relinquish any portion of his claim in order to bring the suit within the jurisdiction of any court. Where a plaintiff omits to sue in respect of or intentionally relinquishes any portion of his claim, he shall not afterwards sue in respect of the portion so omitted or relinquished. 3. A, a person entitled to more than one relief in respect of the same cause of action may sue for all or any of such reliefs, but if he omits except with the leave of the court to sue for all such reliefs, he shall not afterwards sue for any relief so omitted. Section 11. Whether mandatory. Section 11 is mandatory. The plea of res judicata is a plea of law which touches the jurisdiction of a court to try the proceedings. A finding on that plea would oust, oust the jurisdiction of a court. If the requirement of Section 11 are fulfilled, the doctrine of res judicata will apply, and even a concession made by an advocate will not bind a party. Section 11 whether exhaustive. It is well established that the doctrine of res judicata codified in Section 11 of the Code of Civil Procedure is not exhaustive. Section 11 applies to civil suits, but apart from the letter of the law, the doctrine has been extended and applied since long in various other kinds of proceedings and situations by courts in England, India and other countries. In the case of Lal Chand vs. Radha Kishan, Chandrachud J. observed, uh, the fact that Section 11 of the Code of Civil Procedure cannot apply on its terms the earlier proceeding before the competent authority not being a suit is no answer to the extension of the principle underlying that section to the instant case. Section 11, it is long since settled, is not exhaustive and the principle which motivates that section shall can be extended to cases which do not fall strictly within the letter of the law. The principle of res judicata is conceived in a larger public interest which requires that all litigations must sooner than later come to an end. Interpretation. The doctrine of res judicata should be interpreted and applied liberally, since the rule is founded on high public policy and upon the need of giving finality to judicial decisions. A strict and technical construction should not be adopted in deciding whether the doctrine would apply, its substance and not the form should be considered waiver. The plea of res judicata is not one which affects the jurisdiction of the court. The doctrine of res judicata belongs to the domain of procedure and the party may waive any plea of res judicata. Similarly, the court may decline to go into the question of res judicata on the ground that it has not been properly raised in the proceedings on or in the issues. The plea is one which could be waived. Conditions. It is not every matter decided in a former suit that will operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. To constitute a matter as res judicata under section 2, section 11, the following conditions must be satisfied. 1. The matter directly or substantially an issue in the subsequent suit or an issue must be the same matter which was directly and substantially an issue either actually explanation 3 or constructively explanation 4 in the former suit explanation 1. Explanation 7 is to be read with this condition. Then the former suit must have been a suit between the same parties or between the parties under whom they or any of them claim. Explanation 6 is to be read with this condition. Such parties must have been litigating under the same title in the former suit. And then fourth, the court which decided the former suit must be a court competent to try the subsequent suit in which such issue is subsequently raised. Explanation 2 and 8 are to be read in this condition. 5. The matter directly and substantially in issue in the subsequent suit must have been heard and finally decided by the court in the former suit. Explanation 5 is to be read with this condition. The matter in issue. A decision of a competent court on a matter in issue may be res judicata in another proceeding between the same parties. The matter in issue may be an issue of fact, law, or a mixed fact of law and fact. When the expression matter in issue means the rights litigated between the parties, that is, facts on which the right is claimed and the law applicable to the determination of that issue. Such issue may be an issue of fact, law, law, and fact combined. Classification. Matters in issue may be classified as under. Matters in issue, matters directly and substantially in issue, matters collaterally or incidentally in issue. 
matters actually in issue, matter, matters constructively in issue. It matters directly and substantively in issue. Uh, matters can be classified into matters in issue, matters directly and substantially in issue, matters collaterally or incidentally in issue, act matters actually in issue, and matters constructively in issue. Next, matters directly and substantially in issue. Explanation 3. A matter directly and substantially in issue in a former suit will operate as a res judicata in a subsequent suit. Directly means directly, at once, immediately, without intervention. The term has been used in contradistinction to the collaterally or incidentally. A fact cannot be said to be directly in issue if the judgment stands whether the fact exists or does not exist. No hard and fast rule can be laid down as to when a matter can be said to be directly in issue and depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case. Substantially means essentially or materially or in a substantial manner. It is something short of certainty but indeed more than mere suspicion. It means in effect things though, in effect though not in express terms. A matter can be said to be substantially an issue if it is of importance for the decision of a case. No rule of universal application can be laid down as to the when a matter can be said to be substantial, except when the parties by their conduct treated it as a substantial one. Illustrations 1. A sues B for rent due. The defense of B is that no rent is due. Hence the claim for rent is the matter in respect of which the relief is claimed. The claim of rent is therefore a matter directly and substantially an issue. 2. A sues B for supposition of certain properties on the basis of a sale deed in his favour. B impugns the deed as fictitious. The plea is upheld and the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit for some other properties on the basis of the same sale deed is barred. As the issue about the fictitious nature of the sale deed was actually an issue in the former suit directly and substantially. The question whether or not a matter is directly and substantially an issue would depend upon whether a decision on such an issue would materially affect it. The decisions of the suit. The question has to be determined with reference to the plain written statement, issues and judgment. No rule of universal application can be laid down and the question should be decided on the facts of each case. When there are findings on several issues or where the court rests in its decision on more than one point, the findings on all the issues or points will be res judicata. The Supreme Court has rightly observed that it is well settled that if the final decision in any matter at issue between the parties is based by a court on its decisions on more than one point, each of which by itself would be sufficient for the ultimate decision, the decision in each of these points would operate as res judicata between the parties. Illustrations A sues B 1. For declaration of title to certain land and 2. For rent of those lands. B denies A's title to the lands and also contends that no rent is due. In this case, there are two matters in respect of which relief is claimed. 1. The title to the land. 2. The claim for rent. Both these matters are therefore directly and substantially in issue. Next, A sues B for rent for year 1989-90, alleging that the B was liable to pay it. B applied for the time to file written statement, which was refused. The only issue raised by the court was regarding the amount of rent and the suit was decreed. A files another suit against B for rent for the year 1990-91. B contends that he is not liable to pay rent. The question about B's liability for all the years was not alleged and decided in the previous suit and the point was therefore not directly and substantially an issue in the previous suit. The defense is therefore not barred by res judicata. Matter actually an issue. A matter is actually an issue when it is an issue directly and substantially and a competent court decides it on, mer on merits. Matter constructively an issue. Explanation 4. A matter can be said to be constructively an issue when it might and ought to have been made a ground of defense or attack in the former suit. A matter directly and substantially an issue may again be so either actually or constructively. A matter is actually an issue when it is alleged by one party and denied or admitted by the other. Next, it is constructively an issue when it might and ought to have been made a ground of attack or defense in the former suit. Explanation 4. Explanation 4 to section 11 by a deeming provision lays down that any matter which might and ought to have been made a ground of defense or attack in the former suit but which has not been made a ground of attack or defense shall be deemed to have been a matter directly and substantially in issue in such a suit. The principle underlying the explanation 4 is that when the parties have had an opportunity to controverting a matter. That should have been to be the same thing as if the matter had actually been controverted and decided. The object of explanation 4 is to compel the plaintiff or the defendant to take all the grounds of attack or defense which were open to him. In other words, all the grounds of attack and defense must be taken in the suit. A party is bound to bring his whole case in respect of the matter in issue and cannot abstain from relying or giving up any ground which is in controversy and for consideration before a court and afterwards. Make it a cause of action for a fresh suit.
नेक्स्ट कंस्ट्रक्टिव रेजिडी काटा The rule of direct <laughs> res judicata is limited to a matter actually in issue, alleged by one party and either denied or admitted by the other party expressly or impliedly. But the rule of constructive res judicata engrafted in Explanation 4 in Section 11 code is the artificial form of res judicata and provides that if a plea could have been taken by a party in the proceeding between him and his opponent, he should not be permitted to take that plea again against the same party in a subsequent proceeding with reference to the same subject matter. The same party in a subject matter uh, and that clearly is opposed to consideration of public policy on which the doctrine of res judicata is based and would mean harassment and hardship to the opponent. Besides, in such a course is allowed to be adopted, doctrine of finality of the judgments pronounced by courts would also be materially affected. Thus, it helps in raising the bar of res judicata by suitably construing the general principles of subduing a cantankerous litigant. That is why this rule is called constructive res judicata, which in reality is an aspect of amplification of general principles of res judicata. As rightly observed by Somerville, I think that it would be accurate to say that res judicata is not confined to the issues which the court is actually asked to decide, but that it covers issues of facts which are so clearly part of the subject matter of litigation and so clearly could have been raised that it would be an abuse of the process of court of law to allow a new proceeding to be started in respect of them. In the case of Workman v. Board of Trustees, Cochin Portrush, Supreme Court explained the principle of constructive res judicata in the following words, if by any judgment or order any matter and issue has been directly or explicitly decided, the decision operates as res judicata and bars the trial of an identical issue in a subsequent proceeding between the same parties. The principle of res judicata also comes into play when, by judgment and order, a decision of the particular issue is implicit in it, that is, it must be deemed to have been necessarily decided by implication. Then also, the principle of res judicata on that issue is directly applicable. When any matter which might and ought to have been made a ground of defense or attack in the formal proceeding, but was not so made, then such a matter in the eye of law to avoid multiplicity of litigation and to bring about finality in it, it is deemed to have been constructively in issue and therefore is taken as decided. Illustrations A sues B for possession of property on the basis of ownership. The suit is dismissed. A cannot thereafter claim possession of property as a mortgagee as that ground ought to have been taken in the previous suit as a ground of attack. A files a suit against B for declaration that he is entitled to certain lands as a heir of C. The suit is dismissed. In subsequent suit, claiming the same property on the ground of adverse position is barred by constructive res judicata. A files a suit against B to recover money on a pro note. B contends that the promissory note was obtained from him by undue influence. The objection is overruled and the suit is decreed. B cannot challenge the promissory note on the ground of coercion or fraud in a subsequent suit in as much as he ought to have been taken that defense in the former suit. A sues B to recover damages for a breach of contract obtains a decree in his favor. B cannot afterwards sue A for recession of the contract on the ground that it did not fully represent the agreement between the parties, since that ground ought to have been taken by him in the previous suit as a ground for defense. A sues B for possession of certain property, alleging that it has come to his share when partition of joint family property. B's contention that the partition has not taken place is upheld by the court and the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit by A against B for partition of joint family property is not barred. As a mortgager, A sues B for redemption of certain property, alleging that he has mortgaged it with possession to B. The mortgage is not proved and the suit is dismissed. A files another suit against B for possession of the same property, claiming to be the owner thereof. The suit is not barred. A sues B to recover certain property, alleging that B was holding the property under a lease, which has expired. The lease is not proved and the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit by A against B on the base of general title is not barred. A sues B for a declaration that he is entitled to certain property as a heir to FX. The suit is dismissed. A files another suit for injunction on the ground that he has become owner of the property by adverse position. That ground was available to him even at the time of previous suit but was not taken at that time. The subsequent is suit therefore barred. 
ACUS B for a declaration that he is the owner of certain property. The suit is dismissed holding that he is not the owner. At the time of suit, A is in adverse position of the property but has not perfected his title. After the statutory period, A files another suit on the basis of his title by adverse position. The suit is not barred this because intervening event has occurred. In the state of UP, Nawab Hussain versus Nawab Hussain, sub-inspector of police was dismissed from service by a DIG. He challenged the order of dismissal by filing the writ petition in the High Court on the ground that he was not afforded a reasonable opportunity of being heard before passing the order. The condition was however negative and the petition was dismissed. He then filed a suit and raised an additional ground that since he was appointed by the IGP, the DAG had no power to dismiss him. The state contended the suit was barred by construction res judicata. The trial court, the first appellate court as well as the High Court held that the suit was not barred by res judicata allowing the appeal filed by the state. The Supreme Court held that the suit was barred by constructive res judicata as the plea was within the knowledge of the plaintiff and could well have been taken in the earlier petition. The same principle applies to pleas which are not taken but not pressed, which are taken but not pressed at the time of hearing. Explain the doctrine in the decision of the forward construction versus Prabhat Mandal, Supreme Court observed the adjudication is conclusive and final not only to the actual matter determined but as to every other matter which the parties might and ought to have litigated and have had it decided as incidental or essentially connected with the subject matter of litigation and every matter coming within the legitimate purview of the original section, both in respect of the matters of claim or defence. The principle underlying the explanation for is that where the parties have had an opportunity of controverting a matter that should have been taken uh, to the same thing as if the matter had been actually controverted and decided. It is true that where a matter has been constructive in issue, it cannot be said to have actually been heard and decided. It could only be deemed to have been heard and decided. In the leading case of Devilal Modi versus ST, a challenge a challenged the validity of an order of assessment under Article 226. The petition was dismissed on merits. Appeal against the order was also dismissed by Supreme Court on merits. A again filed another strict petition on the same High Court against the same order of assessment by taking some additional grounds. The High Court dismissed the petition on merits. On appeal, the Supreme Court held that the petition was barred by principle of constructive res judicata. Speaking for the court, Kanjanar Gatkar observed, though the courts dealing with the question of infringement of fundamental rights must consistently endeavour to sustain the said rights and should strike down their unconstitutional invasion, it would not be right to ignore the principle of res judicata altogether in dealing with the writ petition filed by citizens alleging the contravention of their fundamental rights. Considerations of public policy cannot be ignored in such cases. And, and the basic doctrine that the judgment pronounced by this Supreme Court are binding and must be regarded as final between the parties in respect of matters covered by them must receive due consideration. Dealing with the possibility of abuse of process of law, the learned Chief Justice made the following remarkable observations which are worth quoting. In the present case, the appellant sought to raise additional points which he brought his, uh, his appeal before this court by special leave. That is to say, he did not take all the points in the red petition and thought of taking new points in appeal. When leave was refused by him, by this court to take those points in appeal, he filed a new petition in the High Court and took those points. And finding that the High Court decided against him on merits on those points, he has come to this court. But that's not all. At the hearing of this appeal, he has filed another petition asking for leave from this court to take some more additional points that shows off that if constructive res judicata is not applied to such proceedings, a party can file any many petitions as he likes and take one or both points two at times at a time. That clarity is opposed to the considerations of public policy on which res judicata is based and would mean harassment and hardship to the opponent. Besides, if such a course is allowed to be taken, the doctrine of finality of judgments pronounced by this court will also be materially affected. My ten ought. A primary object of explanation 4 is to cut short the litigation by compelling the parties to the suit to rely upon all grounds of attack or defence which are available to them at the first time itself. If the plaintiff or defendant fails to take up such ground which he might and ought to have taken, it would be treated to have been raised and decided. The expression might and ought are of wide import. 
The word might presupposes the party affected had knowledge of the ground of attack or defence at the time of previous suit. Ought compels the party to say, take such a ground. The word and between and terms might and ought must be read as conjunctive and not disjunctive. Unless it is proved that the earlier might and ought to have been raised in the previous litigation, there is no constructive res judicata. The question whether a matter might have been made a ground of attack or defence in the former suit rarely presents any difficulty. Whether it ought to have been made a ground of attack or defence depends upon the facts of each case. No rigid rule can be laid down in this regard. One of the tests, however, is to see whether by raising the question the decree which was passed in the previous suit could have been defeated, varied or in any way affected. If the question is of such a nature, it must be deemed to have been a question which ought to have been raised in the former suit and the first instance itself. Matter collaterally or incidentally in issue. The words directly and substantially issue have been used in section 11 in contradistinction to the words collaterally and incidentally in issue. Decisions and matters collateral or incidental to the main issue in a case will not operate as res judicata. A collateral or incidental issue means an issue which is ancillary to the direct and substantive issue. It refers to a matter in respect of which no relief is claimed and yet it is put in issue to enable a court to adjudicate upon the matter which is directly and substantially in issue. The expression collaterally and coincidentally in issue implies that there is another matter which is directly and substantially in issue. Illustration A sues B for rent due. B pleads abatement or rent on the ground that actual areas of the land uh, area of the land is less than that mentioned in the lease deed. The court, however, finds the area is greater than that shown in the lease deed. The finding as to the excess area being ancillary and incidental to the direct substantial issue is not res judicata. In case versus Board of Trustees Cochin Port Trust. In Gangubai Chahubai, a regular civil suit was filed by A against B for a declaration that he, she was the owner of the property and so-called sale deeds had to have been executed by her in favour of B was not real and genuine and also for a possession of property on the ground of title. B contended that he had become the owner of the property and the decree for arrears of rent had been previously passed by the court of small causes in his favour, negating the condition of A that she was the owner. She had been held to be the tenant. Subsequent suit it was contended was therefore barred by the doctrine of res judicata. Negative in the contention, Supreme Court observed, it seems to us that when a finding as to the title of immovable property is rendered by a court of small cause, res judicata cannot be pleaded as a bar in a subsequent regular civil suit for the determination or enforcement of any right or interest in immovable property. In order to operate as res judicata, the finding must be one disposing of a matter directly and substantially in issue in the former suit and the issue should have been heard and finally decided by the court. A matter which is collaterally and incidentally in issue for the purpose of deciding the matter which is directly in issue in this case cannot be made the basis of a plea of res judicata next time when the case comes up. Accordingly, Supreme Court held that the finding rendered by a court of small causes in suit filed by B that the document executed by A was a sale deed cannot operate as a res judicata in the subsequent suit. Next case, matter directly and substantially in issue and matter collaterally or incidentally in issue. Distinction in order to operate is res judicata, a matter must have been directly and substantially in issue in a former suit and not merely collaterally and incidentally in issue therein. It is therefore necessary to draw a distinction between matter directly and substantially in issue and matter collaterally and incidentally in issue. Matter is directly and substantially in issue if it is necessary to decide it in order to adjudicate the principal issue and if the judgment is based upon that decision. A matter is collaterally or incidentally in issue if it is necessary to decide it in order to grant a relief to a plaintiff or to a defendant and the decision on such issue either way does not affect the final judgment. Whether a matter was directly or substantially in issue or merely collaterally or incidentally in issue has to be determined with reference to the plaint, written statement, issues and judgment in the suit. Such question must be decided on the fact of each case and no cut and dry test can be laid down. Findings on several issues. When there are findings on several issues where the court rests its decision on more than one point, the findings on all the items issues will operate as res judicata. The Supreme Court has stated it is well settled that if the final decision in any matter at issue between the parties is based by a court on its decision in more than one point, each of which by itself would be sufficient for the ultimate decision, the decision on each of these points operates as res judicata between the parties. Findings on matter not in issue. If a finding is recorded by a court in a former suit, on a question not in issue between the parties, it will not operate as a res judicata. 
the same result will follow if the matter is not dealt with by the court or merely an opinion has been expressed over a question which did not directly arise in the suit suit meaning the expression suit has not been defined in the court but it is a proceeding which is commenced by presentation of a plaint in hansraj gupta versus official liquidator the lordship of privy council have defined the expression thus the word suit ordinarily means and apart from some context must be taken to mean a civil proceeding instituted by presentation of a plaint in pandurang ramachandra versus shantabai ramachandra supreme court has stated in its comprehensive sense the word suit is understood to apply to any proceeding in a court of justice by which an individual pursues that remedy which the law affords the modes of proceedings may be various but that if a right is litigated between the parties in a court of justice the proceeding by which the decision of the court is sought by a suit may be a suit formally looking to legislature background of section 11 the expression suit was construed literally and grammatically including the whole of the suit and not a part of thereof of a material issue arising therefrom but in amendment of 76 a more extensive meaning is given to the connotation of suit and now the mode of proceeding is not material at the same time however if the proceeding is of a summary nature not falling within the definition of a suit it may not be so treated for the purpose of section 11 again the word suit in section 11 means proceedings in a court of first instance as distinguished from the proceedings in appellate court though the general principles of res judicata apply to appellate jurisdiction also former suit explanation one solution 11 provides that no court shall try any suit or issue in which the matter has been directly or substantially in issue in a former suit between the same parties and has been heard and finally decided explanation 1 to section 11 provides that the expression former suit shall denote a suit which has been decided prior to the suit in question whether or not it was instituted prior thereto it is not the date on which the suit is filed but the matters that matters but the date on which the suit is decided so that even if the suit was filed later it will be the former suit within the meaning of explanation 1 if it has been decided earlier issue meaning section 11 bars trial of any suit as well as an issue which has been decided in the former suit issue sir of three kinds issue of fact issue of law and mixed issue of law and fact a decision and issue of fact however erroneous it may be constitute res judicata between the parties to the previous suit and cannot be reagitated in collateral proceedings a mixed issue of law and fact also for the same reason operates a res judicata but there were conflicting views on the question as to how far a decision in the question of law would operate as res judicata but the conflict was set at rest by the powerful pronouncement of the supreme court in the case of mathura prasad versus doshi bai wherein after considering the case law on the point the court held that generally a decision of a competent court even in a point of law operates as res judicata however a pure question of law unrelated to the fact to give rise to a right it does not operate as res judicata thus when the cause of action is different or when the law has since the since the earlier decision has altered by a competent authority or when the decision related to jurisdiction of a court to try the earlier proceedings or where the earlier decision declared valid a transaction which is prohibited by law the decision does not operate as res judicata in a subsequent proceeding a friends made to uh, avatar singh versus jagjit singh where in a peculiar problem arose in a suit filed filed by a in a civil court a preliminary contention regarding jurisdiction of the court was taken by b the objection was upheld and the plaint was returned to the plaintiff for presentation to the revenue court when a approached the revenue court it returned the petition holding that the revenue court had no jurisdiction once again a filed a civil suit in a civil court court it was contended by b that the suit was barred by res judicata the court though it sympathized with the dilemma wherein the plaintiff was placed and was driven from pillar to post dismissed the suit upholding the contention of the defendant the court stated if the defendant does not appear and the court on its own returns the plaint on the ground of lack of jurisdiction or the order in a subsequent suit may not operate as res judicata but if the defendant appears and the issue is raised and included decided therein then the decision on the question of jurisdiction will not operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit although the reasons for its decision may not be so it is submitted that the view taken by supreme court in avatar singh is erroneous and the law does not lay down the correct law as stated above a pure question of law unrelated to facts touching on the jurisdiction of a court does not operate as res judicata between the same parties in a subsequent suit avatar singh was decided by a division bench of two judges unfortunately 
Madhura Prasad which was decided earlier and that too by a division bench of three judges was not brought to the notice of the court. Thus, Avtar Singh was decided per inquirium and cannot be said to be good law. It is submitted that the view taken by Supreme Court in Mathura Prasad vs. Dosibai is correct. The following observation of Shah will lay down the correct principle of law are therefore worth quoting. The matter and issue, if it is one purely of fact, decided in the earlier proceeding by a competent court, must in a subsequent litigation between the same parties be regarded as finally decided and cannot be reopened. A mixed question of law and fact determined in the earlier proceeding between the same parties may not for the same reason be questioned in a subsequent proceeding between the same parties. But where the decision is a question of law, that is the interpretation of a statute, it will be res judicata in a subsequent proceeding between the same parties where the cause of action is the same. For the expression, the matter in issue in section 11 of the Code of Civil Procedure means the right litigated between the parties, that is the facts on which the right is claimed and denied and the law applicable to the determination of that issue where however the question is one purely of law and it relates to the jurisdiction of the court or a decision of the court sanctioning something which is illegal by resort to the rule of res judicata a party affected by the decision will not be precluded from challenging the validity of that order under the rule of res judicata for a rule of procedure cannot supersede the law of the land same parties the second condition of res judicata is that the former suit must have been a suit between the same parties and between the parties with whom they or any of them claim. This condition recognizes the general principle of law that judgments and decrees bind the parties and privies. Therefore, when the parties in subsequent suit are different from the former suit, there is no res judicata. Illustration A sues B for rent. B contends that A is not the landlord. The suit is dismissed. Subsequent suit either by A or by X claiming through A is barred by res judicata. A sues B for rent. B contends that C and not A is the landlord. A fails to prove his title and suit is dismissed. A then sues B and C for a declaration of his title to the property. The suit is not as barred as the parties to both suits are not the same. Meaning a party is a person whose name appears on the record at the time of decision. There is a person who has intervened in the suit is a party, but a party to the suit whose name is struck off or who is discharged from the suit or who dies pending the suit but whose name continues on record erroneously is not a party. A party may be plenty for a defendant. Res judicata between co-defendants as a meter may be res judicata between a plaintiff and defendant. Similarly, it may be res judicata between co-defendants and co-plaintiffs also. An adjudication will operate as res judicata between co-defendants if the following conditions are satisfied. There must be a conflict of interest between co-defendants. It must be necessary to decide the conflict in order to give relief to the plaintiff. The question between co-defendants must have been finally decided and the co-defendants were necessarily or proper parties in the former suit. If these conditions are satisfied, adjudication will operate a res judicata between co-defendants. Illustration A sues B, C and D in order to decide the claim of A. The court has to interpret a will. The decision regarding the construction of will on rival claims of defendant will operate a res judicata in any subsequent suit. The test for res judicata between co-defendants has been laid down. In the case of Cottingham vs. Earl of Shrewsbury in the following words, if a plaintiff cannot get his right without trying and deciding a case between co-defendants, the court will then try and decide. decide the case and the co-defendants will be bound. But if the relief given to the plaintiff does not require or involve decision of any case between co-defendants, the co-defendants will not be bound by, by it as between each other by any proceeding which may be necessary only to the decree by the plaintiff obtains. In Mehmoob Shah versus Sayyid Ismail, Supreme Court added a word of caution while applying the doctrine of res judicata between co-defendants by stating doctrine of res judicata would apply even though the party against whom it is sought to be enforced was not eo nomine made by a party not entered appearance nor did he contest the question. The doctrine of res judicata must however be applied to co-defendants with great care and caution. The reason is that fraud is an extrinsic collateral act which initiates the most solemn proceedings of courts of justice. If a party obtains a decree from the court by practicing fraud or collusion, he cannot be allowed to say that the matter is res judicata and cannot be reopened. Res judicata between co-plaintiffs. 
just as a matter may be resolute kata between co-defendants, a matter may be resolute kata between co-plaintiffs. If there is a conflict between interests of plaintiffs and it is necessary to resolve the same by a court in order to give relief to a defendant and the matter is in fact decided, it will operate as res judicata between co-plaintiffs in any subsequent suit. Pro forma defendant. A defendant is suit against whom no relief is claimed is called a pro forma defendant. A person may be added as a pro forma defendant in a suit merely because his presence is necessary for a complete and final decision of the questions in the suit. In such a case, since no relief is sought against him, a finding does not operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit against him. On the other hand, the fact that the party is described as a pro forma defendant or that no relief is claimed against him is by itself not sufficient to avoid the bar of res judicata if other conditions laid down in the section are satisfied. Illustrations A sues B for a possession of property contending that he is a tenant of C. C joined as pro forma defendant and no relief is claimed against him. The suit is dismissed as the court finds B to be the owner. C then sues B for a possession on the basis of title. B's contention that the issue regarding ownership of the property is res judicata must fail as the issue was decided in the former suit between A and B and not between C and B as C was only a pro forma defendant. Next case. A sues B for rent claiming to be a sole shibat. B contends that X was also a coast shibat and the suit filed by A alone was therefore not maintainable. X was joined as a pro forma defendant and no relief was claimed against him. A finding by the court that A was the sole shibat would operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit between X and A on the question of co ship, as the decision in the previous suit was necessary for granting relief in favor of A. Next, interveners. An intervener is one who intervenes in a suit in which he was not originally a party as affected an affected party who with the court's permission participates in a lawsuit after its inception by either joining with the plaintiff or uniting with the defendant. He is an intervener. A person may intervene in a suit either at either on his own behalf or behalf of the parties with the leave of the court. Such intervener is considered to be a party to the suit once he is permitted to intervene, no matter at what stage of the suit he intervenes. The decision in the suit that will operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit by or against such person, intervener on the point already decided. Minors When a suit is filed against a minor who is duly represented by a guardian or a next friend and a decree is passed in such a suit, the decree binds the minor, but if the decree is obtained against a minor not represented by a guardian or there is fraud, collusion or gross negligence of the guardian, a decree passed in the suit will not operate as res judicata against him, the minor, in a subsequent suit. The parties under whom they or any of the, them claim, as stated above, the doctrine of res judicata operates not only against the parties or their privacy also, that is persons claiming under the parties to the decision. The object underlying the doctrine of res judicata is that if a proceeding originally instituted is proper, the decision given therein is binding on all persons whom a right, on whom a right or interest may devolve. Parties under whom they or any of them claim comprise two classes of persons, parties actually present in the former suit, second parties claiming under the parties to the suit that is privies and persons represented by a party in the former suit explanation sex. Illustration A sues B for a declaration of title to the property and obtains a decree. Thereafter A sues C for possession of the property. C contends that B is the owner and that he is in possession of B as B's tenant. The defense is barred in as much as C claims through B. Representative to C. Suit. Explanation 8. Explanation 6 to section 11 deals with representative suits, that is, suits instituted by or against the person in, whose, in his representative as distinguished from the individual capacity. This explanation provides that where a person's litigate bona fide in respect of a public right or a private right claimed in common for themselves and others and all persons interested in such a right shall for the purpose of section 11 be deemed to claim under the person so litigating. Explanation 6 thus illustrates one aspect of the constructive res judicata. Thus where a representative suit is brought under section 92 of the court and a decree is passed in such a suit law assumes that all persons who have the same interest as plaintiffs in the representative suit are represented by the set plaintiffs and therefore are constructively barred by res judicata from re-agitating the matters directly and substantially in issue in the former 
suit. The underlying principle is that if the very issue is litigated in the former suit and is decided, there is no good reason why the others making the same claim cannot be held to be claiming a right in common for themselves and others. In explanation 6, if that view is not taken, it would necessarily mean that there would be two inconsistent decrees and one of the tests in deciding whether the doctrine of res judicata applies to a particular case or not is to determine whether two inconsistent decrees will come into existence if res judicata is not applied. Conditions The following conditions must be satisfied before a decision may operate as res judicata under explanation 6. There must be a right claimed by one or more persons in common for themselves and others not expressly named in the suit. The parties not expressly named in the suit must be interested in such a right. The litigation must have been conducted bona fide and on behalf of all the parties interested. And if the suit is under Order 1, Rule 8, all conditions laid down therein must have been strictly complied with. It is only when the above conditions are satisfied that the decision may operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. Thus, where a party claims a right for himself alone, which happens to be common to him and others, it cannot be said that he was litigating on behalf of others. And explanation 6 does not apply. Similarly, in the earlier proceeding was not a bona fide public interest litigation. The subsequent proceeding would not be barred. The possibility of litigation to foreclose any further inquiry into a matter in which an inquiry is necessary in the interest of public cannot be overlooked. Public interest litigation. If the object of explanation 6 of section 11 is considered, there is no good reason why it cannot apply to a bona fide public interest litigation. If the previous litigation was a bona fide public interest litigation in respect of a right which was common and was agitated in common with others, the decision in previous litigation would operate as res judicata in a previous litigation and in a subsequent litigation. But if the earlier proceeding was not bona fide public interest litigation, the subsequent proceeding would not be barred. Next, same title. The third condition of res judicata is that the parties to the subsequent suit must have litigated under the same title as the former suit. The same title means the same capacity. Title refers to the capacity or interest of a party, that is to say, whether he sues or is sued for himself or in his own interest or for himself as representing the interest of another or as representing the interest of others along with himself. It has nothing to do with the particular cause of action on which he sues or is sued. Litigating under the same title means that a demand should be of the same quality in the second suit as well as was in the first suit. It has nothing to do with the cause of action in which he sues or is sued. Illustration A sues B for title to the property as a heir of C under customary law. The suit is dismissed. The subsequent suit for the title to the property as heir of C under personal law is barred. A sues B for possession of property as an owner. Basing on his claim and title, the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit for personal property on the ground of adverse position is barred. A sues B for personal property as an owner. Basing his claim on title, the suit is dismissed. A subsequent suit by A against B for possession of the same property as mortgager is not barred. A sues for possession of man, much property as a heir of Mahant. The suit is dismissed. Subsequent suit by A against B as the manager of the mutt is not barred. Test. The test for res judicata is the identity of the title in the two litigations and not the identity of the subject matter involved in the two cases. The crucial test for determining whether the parties are litigating in a suit under the same title as in the previous suit is of the capacity in which they sue or were sued. The term same title has nothing to do with either of the cause of action or with the subject matter of two suits. Where the right claimed in both suits is the same, the subsequent suit will be barred. Even though the right in the subsequent suit is sought to be established on a ground different from the one of the former suit, competent court. The fourth condition of res judicata is that the court which decided the former suit must have been the competent court competent to try the subsequent suit. Thus, the decision in a previous suit by a court not competent to try the subsequent suit will not operate as a res judicata. Object. The principle behind this condition is a sound one, namely, that the decision of the court of limited jurisdiction ought not to be final and binding on a court of unlimited jurisdiction. Competent court meaning explanation 8. The expression competent to try means competent to try the subsequent suit if brought at the time of the first suit was brought. In other words, the relevant point of time for deciding the question of competence of the court is the date when the former suit was brought and not the date on which the subsequent suit was filed. Types of courts 
Next, in order that the decision of the former suit may operate as res judicata, the court will decide the suit must have been either court of exclusive jurisdiction, court of limited jurisdiction, court of concurrent jurisdiction, court of exclusive jurisdiction. The plea of res judicata can successfully be taken in respect of judgments of court of exclusive jurisdiction. Like revenue courts, land acquisition courts, administrative courts. If a matter directly and substantially an issue in a former suit has been adjudicated upon by a court of exclusive jurisdiction, such adjudication will bar the trial of the same matter in a subsequent suit in an ordinary civil court. Court of limited jurisdiction, in addition on the issue heard and finally decided by a court of limited jurisdiction, will also operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit, irrespective of the fact that such court of limited jurisdiction was not competent to try the subsequent suit. The expression court of limited jurisdiction has been interpreted differently by different high courts. In Naveen Maji v. Tela Maji, the High Court of Calcutta held that courts of limited jurisdiction are courts other than the ordinary civil courts such as revenue court, land acquisition court and insolvency courts. A court of limited pecuniary jurisdiction cannot be said to be a court of limited jurisdiction. Reading the explanation 8 along with section 11, it is clear that if the former court is unable to try the subsequent suit as beyond its pecuniary jurisdiction, the decision of the former court will not operate as res judicata in the subsequent suit. On the other hand, in PVN Devaki Amma v. PVN Kuniraman, High Court of Kerala did not agree with the Calcutta view in Naveen Maji case and observed that the term a court of limited jurisdiction is wide enough to include a court whose jurisdiction is subject to pecuniary jurisdiction and it will not be right to interpret the said expression as connoting only courts other than ordinary civil courts. Such a narrow and restricted interpretation is not warranted by the words used by the parliament. It is submitted that the view taken by the High Court of Kerala in Devaki Amma is correct and preferable to the one taken by High Court of Calcutta in Nabin Maji. The point is, however, concluded by addition of Supreme Court in Sulochana Amma v. Narayan Nair, Court of Concurrent Jurisdiction, where the court decided the former suit was a court of concurrent jurisdiction having competence to try the subsequent suit. The decision given by it would operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. Concurrent jurisdiction means concurrent as regards the pecuniary limit as well as the subject matter of the suit. Competency in section 11 has no reference to territorial jurisdiction of the court. As seen above, the ambit and scope of explanation 8 has been interpreted differently by different high courts. In Nabin Maji v. Tela Maji, it was contended that a court of Munsiv by reason of its limited pecuniary jurisdiction can be said to be a court of limited jurisdiction and hence, its decision would operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit instituted in the court of subordinate judge. Negativing the contention interpreting explanation 8 in the light of the substantive provision section 11, court observed, one of the conditions of the applicability of section 11 is that the court in which the former suit was instituted must be competent to try the subsequent suit. If the former suit is unable to try the subsequent suit and it is beyond its pecuniary jurisdiction, decision of the former court will not be res judicata in the subsequent suit. If the legislature had really intended to remove the condition retaining to the competency of the former court, in that case it would have removed the same from the section itself. In the face of the provision of section 11, retaining the set condition for applicability of res judicata that the former court must be competent to try the subsequent suit, it is difficult for us to accept the interpretation of explanation 8 as suggested on behalf of the appellant. High Court of Kerala, however, took a contrary view in POK Devokiyama versus PVN Kuniraman, disagreeing with the ratio laid down in Abhin Maji and keeping in mind the object of enacting explanation 8, the court concluded, in our opinion, the expression a court of limited jurisdiction is wide enough to include a court whose jurisdiction is subject to a pecuniary li interpretation, uh, limitation and it will not be right to interpret the said expression as connoting only courts other than ordinary civil courts. Such a narrow and restricted interpretation is not warranted by the words used by the parliament. A statement of object and reasons for the bill which subsequently enacted the, the amending act of 76 and the report of the joint select committee which affected some substantial changes in the bill as originally drafted, make it abundantly clear the intention of underlying the explanation 8 was that the decision of the courts of limited jurisdiction should operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit, although the court of limited jurisdiction may not be competent to try such subsequent suit. In our opinion, the object and purpose of underlying the introduction of explanation 8 was much wider, namely to render the principle of subject res judicata fully effective so that the issues heard and finally decided between the parties to an action by any court competent to decide such issues should not be allowed to be re-agitated to be 
by such parties or persons claiming through any subsequent litigation. It is submitted that the above observation Devaki Amma lays down the correct proposition of law. The underlying object of the amendment in section of explanation 8 is to avoid multiplicity of suits. It is no doubt true that Parliament was not deleted section 11, the words in a court of competent to try such subsequent suit or suit in which the such equation has subsequently been raised. But the section and the explanation must be read harmoniously. If it is not so read, the primary object of enacting Explanation 8 will be defeated inasmuch as the party by adding some property or increasing the value thereof from time to time may go on instituting suits after suits, deliberately and successfully avoiding the decision against him to operate as res judicata. It would encourage endless litigation. It is further submitted that it would be better had the Parliament, in view of the insertion of Explanation 8 by the Amendment of 76, deleted the words a court competent to try such subsequent suit or a suit in which such issue has been subsequently raised. But it is settled law that an explanation to a section in a given case, instead of serving the traditional purpose of explaining a section, may work as an independent provision. Ultimately, it is the intention of the legislature which is paramount and mere use of a label cannot control or deflect such intention. Moreover, such a construction would result in an anomalous situation. If a matter is decided by a court of limited jurisdiction, Explanation 8 would apply and then such decision would operate a res judicata in a subsequent suit. But if it is decided by a court of limited pecuniary jurisdiction, the decision would not attract Section 11. That is really absurd. Further, such an interpretation would be against the basic principle underlying the doctrine of res judicata, which is reflected in the well-known maxim that larger public interest requires that all litigations must sooner than later come to an end. Finally, it may result in the conflicting decisions by the same officer. For instance, a decree passed by a rent controller will operate as a res judicata, but a decree passed by a civil judge or a munsif will not be barred by the doctrine though the same officer might have decided both the cases. A special reference may be made to a decision of the Supreme Court in Sulochana Amma v. Narayan Nair. In that case, A by a deed of settlement gave life estate to B and the remainder to C. After death of A, B alienated the property to D. C filed a suit against B. In the Munsif's courts, restraining B from alienating the property and committing acts of waste. During the pendency of the suit, D sold the property to E. C's suit against B was decreed, and it was held that B had no right to alienate the property and permanent injunction was also granted. B's appeal was also dismissed. D, who was not a party to the earlier suit, was committing act of waste. C therefore filed another suit against B and D for permanent injunction. That suit was also decreed. But the question of D's title was left open. C filed a third suit against E in the court of subordinate judge for declaration of his title which was decreed. It was confirmed up to High Court. E approached the Supreme Court. Considering the purpose of the amendment and insertion of Explanation 8, Supreme Court stated, No doubt main body of Section 11 was not amended. At the expression, the Court of Limited Jurisdiction in Explanation 8 is wide enough to include a court whose jurisdiction is subject to pecuniary limitation and other cognate expressions analogous thereto. Therefore, Section 11 is to be read in combination and harmony with Explanation 8. The result that will flow is that an order or an issue which has arisen directly or substantially between the parties or their privacy and decided finally by a competent court or tribunal, though of a limited special jurisdiction, which includes pecuniary jurisdiction, will operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit or proceeding, notwithstanding the fact that such court of limited or special jurisdiction was not competent to try the subsequent suit. The technical aspect for instance, pecuniary or subject-wise, competence of the earlier forum to adjudicate the subject matter or to grant relief sought in the subsequent litigation should be immaterial when the general doctrine of res judicata is to be invoked. Explanation 8 inserted by the amending act of 76 was intended to serve this purpose and to clarify this purpose and to clarify this position. Overruling the very narrow view of the High Court of Calcutta and approving the broader view of the High Court of Kerala, Orissa and Madras, the court went on to observe if the scope of Explanation 8 is confined to the order and decree of insolvency court, the scope of enlarging Explanation 8 would be defeated and the decree of civil courts of limited pecuniary jurisdiction 
shall stand excluded while that of the former would be affected. Such an anomalous situation must be avoided. The tribunal whose decision was not operating as a judicata would be brought within the ambit of section 11 while the decree of the civil court of a limited pecuniary jurisdiction which is accustomed to the doctrine of a judicata shall stand excluded from its operation. Take for instance now the decree of rent controller shall operate as a judicata but a decree of a district municipal civil judge junior division according to the stand of the appellant will not operate as res judicata though the same officer might have decided both the cases. To keep the litigation and ending successive suits must be filed, could be filed in the first instance in the court of limited pecuniary jurisdiction and later in the court of higher jurisdiction and the same issue shall be subject to trial again leading to conflict of decisions. It is obvious from the object of underlying explanation to explanation 8 that by operation of non obstante clause finally, finality is attached to the decree of a civil court of limited pecuniary jurisdiction. Also, to put an end to the vexatious litigation and to the conclusiveness to the issue tried by a competent court, when the same issue is directly and substantially in issue in a later suit between the same parties or their privies by operation of section 11, the parties are precluded from raising one over the, over the same issue for trial. In Church of South India Trust Association versus Telugu Church Council, it was contended lack of territorial jurisdiction goes to the root of the competence of a court trying a suit and a decision rendered by a court lacking territorial jurisdiction would not operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. Negativing the contention and referring to leading decisions on the point, the Supreme Court stated we are therefore of the opinion that section 11 of the present code excluding the explanation 8 envisages the judgment in a former suit would operate as res judicata. If the court which decided the said suit was competent to try the same by virtue of its pecuniary jurisdiction and the subject matter to try the subsequent suit and that it is not necessary that the said court should have territorial jurisdiction to decide the subsequent suit. Test. The test in such a case is whether the second suit could have decided the first court. If the answer to the question is affirmative, decision will operate as res judicata, but if the reply is in the negative, res judicata has no application. Right of appeal explanation 2. Position prior to explanation 2. Under Code 1882, it was held by High Court of Bombay, Madras, Punjab, that a prior decision in which no second appeal lay, such as suits of nature cognizable by a court of small causes when, about, when the amount of subject matter does not exceed 500 rupees, could not operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. In which such opinion was maintainable, the High Court of Calcutta, on the other hand, had taken a contrary view and held that such decision would operate as res judicata, notwithstanding that no second appeal was allowed by law in the former suit. Explanation 2 was inserted in the present code, affirms the Calcutta view and clarifies that the competence of a court does not depend on the right of appeal from a decision from such court. The fact that no second appeal lay in the previous suit is no longer valid ground for holding that the decision in the previous suit would not operate as res judicata. Position after explanation 2. Explanation 2 the 611 makes it clear that for the purpose of res judicata, the competence of the court shall be determined irrespective of any provision as to the right of appeal from the decision of such a court. No doubt, one of the tests for application of the doctrine of res judicata is to ascertain whether a party aggrieved could challenge the finding by filing an appeal. But the question Whether there is a bar of res judicata does not depend on the existence of a right of appeal, but on the question whether the same issue under the circumstances mentioned in section 11 of the code have been heard and finally decided, though the law commission recommended to confer a right of appeal to a successful party against whom a finding has been recorded, the recommendation has not been accepted and the party cannot file an appeal against a finding accorded by him in a court. If the decree is in his favour, heard and finally decided, that's the point, general. The fifth and final condition of res judicata is that a matter directly and substantially in issue in the subsequent suit must have been heard and finally decided by a court in the former suit. In the words of Lord Romilly, 
Res judicata, by its very own words, means a matter upon which the court has exercised its judicial mind and has come to the conclusion that one side is right and pronounced the decision accordingly. The section requires there should be a final decision in which the court must have exercised its judicial mind. In other words, the expression heard and finally decided means a matter on which the court has exercised its judicial mind and after argument and consideration come to a decision on a contested matter. <coughs> it is essential that it should have heard and finally decided. Nature and scope. The matter can be said to have been heard and finally decided, notwithstanding that the former suit was disposed of. Ex parte or by failure to produce evidence, or by a decree or an award by oath tendered by Indian Oaths Act, but if the suit is dismissed on a technical ground, such as non joinder of a necessary party, it would not operate as res judicata. Decision and merits. In order that a matter may be said to have been heard and finally decided, decision in the former suit must have been on merits. Thus, if the former suit was dismissed by a court for want of jurisdiction, for default of plaintiff's appearance, or on the ground of non-joinder or misjoinder of parties, on the ground that the suit was not properly framed, or that it was premature, or that there was a technical defect, decision not being on merits would not operate as res judicata in a subsequent suit. Illustration A. A partnership firm filed a suit against B to recover 50,000 rupees. The suit was dismissed on the ground that it was not maintainable since the partnership firm was not registered as required by the provisions of Indian Partnership Act. Thereafter, the firm was registered and the subsequent suit was filed on the cause, same cause of action. The suit is not barred by res judicata, necessity of decision. In order to operate as res judicata, the finding of a court must have been necessary for the determination of a suit. If a finding is not necessary, it will not operate as res judicata. It is fairly settled that the finding on an issue in the earlier suit to operate as res judicata should not have been only directly and substantially an issue, but it should have been necessary to be decided as well. What operates as res judicata is the ratio of what is fundamental to the decision. It cannot, however, be ram ramified or expanded by logical extension, and a finding on an issue cannot be said to be necessary to the decision of a suit unless the decision was based on such finding. <coughs> Again, a decision cannot be said to have been based upon a finding unless an appeal can lie against such a finding. The underlying principle is that everything that should have the authority of res judicata is and ought to be subject to appeal and reciprocally an appeal is not admissible on any point not having the authority of res judicata. It is the right of appeal which indicates whether the finding was necessary or merely incidental. Finding on more than one issue. When a finding is recorded by a court on more than one issue, the legal position is as under. When a suit is dismissed, if the plaintiff's suit is wholly dismissed, no issue decided against the defendant can operate as res judicata against him in a subsequent suit. For he cannot appeal from a finding on any such issue, the decree being wholly in his favour. But every issue decided against the plaintiff may operate as res judicata against him in a subsequent suit. For he can appeal from a finding on such issue, the decree being against him. When the suit is decreed, if the plaintiff's suit is wholly decreed, no issue decided against him can operate as res judicata, for he cannot appeal from a finding on any such issue, the decree being wholly in his favour. But every issue decided against the defendant is res judicata, for he can appeal from a finding on such issue, the decree being against him. Next, appeal against finding. <coughs> no appeal lies against a mere finding. For the simple reason, the court does not provide for filing of any such appeal. It may, however, be stated the person aggrieved by a finding in the judgment may file cross objection, even though the decree might have been passed in his favour. Right of appeal. A decision cannot be said to have been based upon a finding unless an appeal lies against such finding. As a general rule, everything that should have been authority of res judicata is and ought to be subject to appeal. And reciprocally, an appeal is not competent on any point not having the authority of res judicata. It is the right of appeal which indicates whether the finding was necessary or merely incidental. The position is, however, substantially changed by Amendment Act 76. Relief claimed but not granted Explanation 5. Explanation 5 to Section 11 provides that if a relief is claimed in a suit, but it is not expressly granted in the decree, it will be deemed to have been refused. The matter in respect of which the relief is claimed will be res sub judicata. But, res judicata, but this explanation applies only when the relief claimed is substantial relief and the court is bound to grant it. 
execution proceedings prior to addition of explanation 6 7 to section 11 by amendment act the court civil procedure the provision thereof did not in terms of applying execution proceedings but the general principles of res judicata were held to be applicable even to execution proceedings section 11 has now amended act 76 explanation 7 specifically provides provisions of section 11 will directly apply to execution proceedings also industrial adjudication Though section 11 of the code speaks about civil suits only, the general principles underlying the doctrine of res judicata may even to an industrial adjudication. Thus, an award pronounced by the industrial tribunal operates as res judicata between the same parties and the payment of wages authority has no jurisdiction to entertain the said claim again. Similarly, if in an earlier case the labor court has decided that A was not a workman under the Industrial Dispute Act, and the said finding operates as res judicata in subsequent proceedings also. There was good reason why this principle was extended and applied to industrial adjudication also. Legislation regulating the relation between capital and labor has two objects in view. It seeks to ensure workmen who have not the capacity to combat capital on equal terms, fair returns for their labor. It also seeks to prevent a dispute between employers and employees, so that the production might not be adversely affected and the larger interest of the society might not suffer. Thus, where an award was passed in earlier proceedings, it was held that the said award was binding on parties and subsequent proceedings initiated by the employees were barred. In Bombay Gas Company Limited vs. Jagannath Pandurang, Supreme Court observed the doctrine of res judicata is wholesome one which is applicable not merely to matters governed by the provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure, but all litigations. It proceeds on the principle that there should be no unnecessary litigation and whatever claims and defenses are open to parties should all be put forward at the same time, provided no confusion is likely to arise <coughs> by suiting, so putting forward all such claims. In other words, the principle underlying Section 11 expressed in the maxim, interest Republic ut sit finis litium. It is in the interest of the state that there should be an end to litigation. It is founded on sound public policy and is of universal application. Otherwise, great injustice might be done under color and pretense of law. The rule of res judicata is dictated by a wisdom for all time to come. However, the technical rule of res judicata cannot apply to industrial adjudication since it is meant and suited for ordinary civil litigation. Principles analogous to res judicata can be availed of to scuttle any attempt at raising industrial disputes repeatedly in defiance of operative settlements and awards. But this hyper-technical concept of civil justice must be kept within precise confined limits of the field of industrial education, which must as far as possible be free from such technicalities which thwart the resolution of industrial disputes. Therefore, the principles of res judicata should be applied with caution to industrial adjudication. Thus, even where conditions of service have been changed many a few years before, Industrial adjudication has allowed fresh changes when convinced of the necessity and justification for the same. Similarly, wage structure revision of pay scales can be examined on the merits of each individual case and technical considerations of res judicata should not be allowed to hamper the discretion of industrial adjudication. It is submitted that the following observations of Gajendra Gatkar in the case of Trichnopoly Mills v. National Cotton Textile Mills. Lays down correct law on the point and requires to be quoted. It is not denied that the principle of res judicata cannot be strictly invoked in the decision of each point, though it is equally true that industrial tribunals would not be justified in changing the amount of rehabilitation from year to year without sufficient cause. Taxation matters. The liability to pay tax from year to year is in a separate and distinct and independent liability. Each year of assessment is therefore a separate unit and does not apply to subsequent assessment. Consequently, Doctrine of res judicata has no application in such cases. A distinction, however, must be made between a question of fact and pure question of law. Each assessment year being an independent unit addition for one year may not operate as res judicata in another year. But if one pure question of law, constitutional validity of a statute is decided, it may not be easy to hold that the decision on this basic and material issue would not operate as res judicata against the SSC for a subsequent year. Public interest litigation. Since the public primary object of res judicata is to bring an end to litigation, there is no reason not to extend the doctrine to public interest litigation. In Forward Construction v. Prabhat Mandal, the Supreme Court has directly called upon to decide the question. The Apex Court held that the principle would apply in public interest litigation provided it was a bona fide litigation. In another case, it was observed that it is a repetitive litigation on the very same issue coming up before the courts again and again in the garb of public interest litigation. 
it is high time to put an end to the same criminal proceedings the doctrine of judicata is of universal application it is a fundamental concept in the organization to every jural society the rule therefore should apply even to criminal proceedings once a person is acquitted or convicted by a competent criminal court he cannot once again be tried for the same offense as held by the supreme court the principle of judicata is applicable to criminal proceedings also In Sambasimha versus Public Prosecutor Federation of Malaya Lord McDermott rightly stated the maxim res judicata pro veritate exequatur it is no less applicable to criminal than to civil proceedings writ petitions general it is settled since long that section 11 of the code does not in terms apply to writ petitions there is no good ground to preclude decisions on matters in controversy in writ proceedings under article 32 or 226 of the constitution from operating as res judicata in subsequent petitions are regular suits on the same matter in controversy between the same parties and thus to give time limited effect to the principle of uh, finality of decision after the full contest doctrine explained in msr sharma versus dr sri krishna for the first time supreme court held that the general principle of res judicata applies even to writ petitions filed under article 32 of the constitution of india thus if once the petition filed under article 32 of the constitution is dismissed by the court subsequent petition is barred similarly A merit petition filed by a party under a 226 is considered on merits as a contested matter and is dismissed. The decision thus pronounced would continue to bind the parties unless it is otherwise modified or reversed in appeal or in other appropriate proceedings permissible under the constitution. It would not be open to a party to ignore the said judgment and again move the high court under article 226 or the supreme court under article 32 on the same facts and for obtaining the same or a similar order or writs. In a leading case, Darya Rao v. UP, the Supreme Court has placed the doctrine of restitutica on a higher footing, considering and treating the binding character of the judgment pronounced by competent courts as essential part of the rule of law. Gajendra Gatkar rightly observed, it is in the interest of the public at large that a finality should attach to the binding decisions pronounced by courts of competent jurisdiction, and it is also in the public interest that the individual should not be vexed twice with the same kind of litigation. If these two principles form the foundation of the general rule of res judicata they cannot be treated as irrelevant or inadmissible even in the dealing with fundamental rights in petitions filed under article 32 again there is no good reason to preclude the decision matters in controversy in writ proceedings under article 226 or 32 of the constitution from operating as res judicata in subsequent regular suits on the same matters in controversy between the same parties and thus to give limited effect to the principle of the finality of decisions after full contest in golapchan chotalal parik versus state of gujarat supreme court observed we are of the opinion that the provisions of section 11 cpc are not exhaustive with respect to the earlier decisions operating a res judicata between the same parties on the same matter in controversy in a subsequent regular suit and that on general principle of res judicata any previous decision on the matter in controversy decided after full contest and after affording fair opportunity to the parties to prove their case by a court competent to decide it will operate as res judicata in a subsequent regular suit it is not necessary that the court deciding the matter formally be competent to decide the subsequent suit or that the formal proceeding and subsequent suit have the same subject matter nature of the formal proceeding is immaterial summary dismissal sometimes a peculiar situation arises a petition may be dismissed by the court in limine without admitting it for final hearing the question may arise whether such a dismissal of a petition operates as res judicata no hard and fast rule can be laid down and whether or not such order is dismissal would constitute a bar on upon the facts and circumstances of each case and upon the nature of the order if the order is on merits it would be a bar if the order shown that the dismissal was for the reason that the petitioner was guilty of latches and that he had an alternative remedy it would not if the petition is dismissed in limine without passing a speaker speaking order then such dismissal cannot be treated as creating a bar of res judicata it is from that prima facie dismissal in limine even without passing a speaking order in that behalf may strongly suggest that the court took the view that there was no substance in the petition at all but in the absence of a speaking order it would not be easy to decide what factors weighed on the mind of the court and that makes it difficult and unsafe to hold that such a summary dismissal is a dismissal on merits and as such constitutes a bar on res judicata 
summary dismissal does not affect the jurisdiction of the court to entertain a fresh petition if the petition is dismissed as withdrawn it cannot be a bar to subsequent petition article 32 under article 32 because in such a case there has been no decision on merits by the court the reason is simple the order of a court has to be read as it is if the court intended to dismiss the petition at the threshold it could have said so explicitly in the absence of any indication in the order itself it would not be proper to enter into an arena of conjecture and to come to a conclusion on the basis of extraneous evidence that the court in fact intended to dismiss the petition on merits if a non speaking order of dismissal of a petition cannot operate as a res judicata then the court in fact uh, obviously an order permitting the withdrawal of a petition for the same reason cannot also operate as res judicata at the same time however if a petitioner withdraws the petition without permission to file a fresh petition on the same cause of action a subsequent a petition is not maintainable constructive res judicata a question sometimes arises as to whether the role of constructive res judicata can be applied to writ petitions this question arose for the first time before the supreme court in case of amalgamated coal fields versus janapada sabha in that case the earliest notices issued by the respondent sabha against the companies calling upon them to pay tax were challenged on certain grounds at the same at the time of hearing of the petitions an additional ground was also taken and the authority of the sabha to create the rate of tax was challenged however since there was no pleading the set point was not allowed to be argued and the petition was dismissed the set decision was upheld even by supreme court thereafter once again when the notices were issued in respect of different period they were challenged on that additional ground which was not permitted to be argued in the previous litigation the high court dismissed the petitions holding that they were barred by res judicata allowing the appeal supreme court observed it is significant that the attack against the validity of the notices in the present proceedings is based on grounds different and distinct from the grounds raised on the earlier occasion it is not as if the same ground which was urged on the earlier occasion is placed before the court in another fora the grounds now urged are entirely distinct and so the decision of the high court can be upheld only if the principle of constructive res judicata could be valid to apply to writ petitions filed under 32 and 226 in our opinion constructive res judicata which is a special and artificial form of res judicata enacted by section 11 of the cpc should not generally be applied to writ petitions filed under 32 or 226 in gulab chand chotalal parik versus state of gujarat supreme court did not decide the point whether principles of constructive res judicata could be applied to writ petitions and the set question was left open however now the position appears to be well settled that the principles of constructive res judicata also apply to writ petitions in devilal modi versus sto discussing the applicability of constructive res judicata supreme court observed this rule postulates that if a plea could have been taken by a party in a proceeding between him and his opponent he would not be permitted to, to take that plea against the same party in a subsequent proceeding which is based on the same cause of action but basically even this view is founded on the same consideration of public policy because if the doctrine of constructive res judicata is not applied to writ proceedings it would be open to the party to take one proceeding after another and urge new grounds every time and the plaintiff is inconsistent with considerations of public policy A direct question however arose before the supreme court in the case of state of up versus nawab hussain in that case police si was dismissed from service by dig he challenged the state decision by filing a writ in the high court on the ground that he was not afforded a reasonable opportunity but the petition was dismissed he then filed a suit and raised additional plea that he was appointed by igp and dig was not competent to pass an order against him the state contended that the suit was barred by constructive res judicata all the courts including the high court held against the state and the matter was taken to the supreme court allowing the appeal and after considering all the leading cases on this point court held that the plea was clearly barred by principle of constructive res judicata as such plea was within the knowledge of the police si and it could have been taken in the writ petition but was not taken at that time 
The principle of Rejo Decata comes into play only when the issue has been directly and explicitly decided by the court, and also when such issue has been implicitly and constructively decided, when any matter which might and ought to have been made a ground of defense or attack in a formal proceeding was not so done, then such matter in the eyes of law to avoid multiplicity of petitions. To bring about finality in its redeemed proceedings was not so made. Such a matter in the eyes of law uh, has been constructively an issue. Therefore, it is taken as has been decided on merits. Habeas Corpus Petitions English as well as American courts have taken the view principle of res judicata is not applicable to the writ of habeas corpus. In India also, the doctrine of res judicata is not made applicable to cases of habeas corpus petitions. In Gulam Sarwar v. Union of India, rejecting the plea of application of constructive res judicata, Supreme Court observed, if the doctrine of constructive res judicata be applied, this court, though is enjoined by the constitution to protect the right of a person illegally detained, will become powerless to do so. That would be whittling down the wide sweep of the constitutional protection. In Lalubai v. Union of India, the petitioner was detained <coughs> and the petition filed against the said order was dismissed by the Supreme Court by an order dated 9th May 1980. But the reasons given was on 4th August 1980. After the order of dismissal but before reasons were recorded, the petitioner filed additional grounds on 21st July 1980. However, on on 30th July 1980, he was informed that he may, if so advised, file a fresh petition on these additional grounds, which he did. The question which arose before the Supreme Court was whether the principle of construction rejudicata judicata could apply to a writ of habeas corpus. After considering leading decisions on the point, Sarkaria, the judge, made the following remarkable observation which he submitted lays down the correct law. The position that emerges from a survey of above decisions is that the application of the above doctrine of constructive res judicata is confined to a civil action and civil proceedings. This principle of public policy is entirely inapplicable to illegal detention and does not bar a subsequent petition for writ of habeas corpus under Article 32 of the Constitution on fresh grounds, which are not taken in an earlier petition of the same uh, relief. General principles in the leading case of Daryao or the state of UP Supreme Court has exhaustively dealt with the question of applicability of principle of res judicata to writ proceedings and lays down certain principles which may be summarized thus. 1. If a petition under 226 is considered on the merits as a contested matter and is dismissed, the decision would continue to bind the parties unless it is otherwise modified or reversed by appeal or other appropriate proceedings permissible under the constitution. It would not be open to a party to ignore the said judgment and move the Supreme Court under Article 32 by original petition made on the same facts and obtaining the same or similar order or writs. If the petition under Article 226 in a High Court is dismissed not on merits but because of lashes of the party applying for the writ or because it is held that the party had an alternative remedy available to it, the dismissal of the writ petition would not constitute a bar to subsequent petition under Article 32. Such a dismissal may, however, constitute a bar to the subsequent application in Article 32, where and if facts thus found by High Court be themselves relevant even under Article 32. If the petition is dismissed in limine and an order is pronounced in that behalf, whether or not the dismissal would constitute a bar would depend on the nature of the order. If the order is on the merits, it would be a bar. If the petition is dismissed in limine without speaking order, such a dismissal cannot be treated as creating a bar of res judicata. If the petition is dismissed as withdrawn, it cannot be a bar for a subsequent petition under Article 32 because in such a case, there had been no decision on merits by the court. To the above principles, a few more may be added. The doctrine of constructive res judicata applies to writ proceedings and any point which might and ought to have been taken but was not taken in an earlier proceeding cannot be taken in a subsequent proceeding. The rule of constructive res judicata, however, does not apply to writ of habeas corpus. Therefore, even after dismissal of one petition of habeas corpus, a second petition is maintainable if fresh and new grounds are available. General principles of res judicata apply to different stages on the same suitor proceeding. If the petitioner withdraws the petition without the leave of the court to institute a fresh petition on the same subject matter, fresh petition is not maintainable. Dismissal for default. The dismissal of suit in default cannot be said to be a matter heard and finally decided on minutes. And hence, such dismissal will not operate as res judicata between the parties in subsequent proceedings. In Chandkaur v. Pratap Singh, the Lordships of Private Council observed the dismissal of a suit for plaintiff's default of appearances was fine, plainly not intended to operate as res judicata. 
No doubt it imposes certain disability upon the plaintiff. For instance, he is thereby precluded from bringing a fresh suit in respect of the same cause of action. Dismissal in Dimini Sometimes an application may be dismissed by the court by one word dismissed. It is well settled that such a dismissal of application in limine without passing a speaking order or recording reasons will not operate as res judicata in subsequent proceedings. No doubt, prima facie such dismissal would indicate that the court considered all the contentions and arguments and of the applicant and dismissed the application not finding any substance therein. But in the absence of a ground for reasons, it is difficult to decide what factors weighed with the court and why order of dismissal was passed. Dismissal of Special Leave Petition SLP Dismissal of SLP in limine by a non-speaking order does not operate as res judicata before the parties, between the parties and will not bar a fresh petition either under Article 32 or 226 of the Constitution. As observed in Workmen v. Board of Trustees Cochin Port, effect of a non-speaking order of dismissal of SLP without anything more indicating the grounds or reasons for a dismissal must by necessary implication be taken to be that the Supreme Court did not consider it to be a fit case where special leave should be granted. The conclusion might have been reached for several reasons, but when the order was not a speaking one, it cannot be assumed that the Supreme Court had necessarily decided all the questions in relation to the merits of the controversy which was under challenge in a special leave petition. The dismissal of a special leave petition in limine by a non-speaking order does not therefore justify any interference, any inference that by necessary implication, the contentions raised in the SLP on the merits of the case have been rejected by the Supreme Court. Ex parte decree. An ex parte decree is a decree passed in the absence of the defendant. When the plaintiff appears and the defendant does not appear, when the suit is called out for hearing even due to even though duly served, the court may hear the suit in the absence of the defendant and pass a decree against him. Such a decree is called ex parte decree. An ex parte decree passed by a competent court on merits will operate as res judicata. The fact that the defendant did not appear and the decree is ex parte is immaterial for the application of section 11 of the court. It is well settled that a party is as much bound by an ex parte decree as by a bi parte decree. The only difference between the two is that in the former, the defendant was absent, while in the latter, he was present. Compromise decree. Compromise decree is not a decision by a court. It is the acceptance by a court of something to which the parties had agreed. A compromise decree merely sets the seal of a court on the agreement of parties. A court does not decide anything, nor can it be said that the decision of a court is implicit in it. Decision of the court are not uniform on questions whether the doctrine of res judicata applies to consent decree. In some cases, it has been held that the consent decree operates as res judicata, whereas in other cases, a contrary view is taken. It is submitted to the correct law is that the doctrine of res judicata does not apply to consent decree. As in a consent decree, a matter cannot be said to have been heard and finally decided on merits. Such a decree, however, precludes a party from challenging it by a rule of estoppel. Withdrawal of a suit. A withdrawal of a suit does not operate as res judicata in filing a subsequent suit for the same cause of action. The basic principle of res judicata having final adjudication and merits, there can be no bar of res judicata if the suit is withdrawn. It is true that the ordinarily when the plaintiff or the applicant find the court is not likely to grant relief, that is, seeks permission to withdraw the suit or application. But since there is no decision on merits, there cannot be a bar on res judicata in instituting a fresh suit of application. Such a withdrawal would be a bar to filing a fresh suit under Order 23, Rule 1 of the Court. Change in Circumstances The doctrine of res judicata applies to static situations and not to changing circumstances. Thus, if a suit for eviction on the ground of bona fide requirement is dismissed, second suit would not operate as res judicata if the circumstances have changed. It is well settled that the bona fide need must be considered with reference to the time when the suit is taken up for hearing and is decided again if the earlier petition by husband against his wife for a divorce on the ground of cruelty or desertion was dismissed for want of evidence, the subsequent petition will not be barred if the wife herself has stated she is not inclined to return to matrimonial home. Change in law, where subsequent decision rendered by a court, the law has been changed, res judicata will not operate. Cases must be decided upon the law as it stands. 
when judgment is pronounced and not upon what it was at the time of previous suit, the law is then untold in the meantime. Erroneous decision. The doctrine of res judicata applies whether the point involved in the earlier decision is one of fact, one of law or one of mixed fact and law. Incorrect decision is not the same as without jurisdiction. A wrong decision by a court having jurisdiction is as much a binding between the parties as a right one and may be set aside only in appeals and revisions in higher courts or tribunals. If the law provides a such remedy, a pure question of law or of jurisdiction, however, does not operate as res judicata. Test. In order to decide any question whether the subsequent proceeding is barred by res judicata, it is necessary to examine the question with reference to forum or competence of the court, parties and their representatives, matters and issue, matters which ought to have been made ground for attack or defense in the former suit, and the final decision, interim orders. Doctrine of res judicata applies to different stages of the same suit or proceeding. If any interlocutory order decides a controversy per part between the parties, such decision would bind the parties and operate as res judicata at all subsequent stages of the suit and the court will not permit the party to set the clock back during the pendency of the proceeding. For instance, orders regarding impediment of parties, maintainability of a suit, jurisdiction of the court, once passed cannot be reopened on the same proceedings. It is however open to the party to challenge the correctness of such order on a regular appeal or on appropriate proceedings arising out of the final judgment of the court, that is review and revision. Res judicata and next is bar of suit, section 12. Where a plaintiff is precluded by rules from instituting a further suit in respect of any particular cause of action, he shall not be entitled to institute a suit in respect of such cause of action in any court to which the court applies. The Code of Civil Procedure precludes the plaintiff from instituting a suit in the following cases. Section 11, where a suit is barred by res judicata. Section 21a, where a decree is sought to be challenged on objection as to the territorial and or pecuniary jurisdiction of a court. Section 47.1, where questions relate to execution, discharge or satisfaction of a decree. Section 95.2, where an order is made on determining the application for computation, compensation for arrest, attachment or temporary injunction. Section 144, clause 2, where restitution can be claimed. Order 2, rule 2, where there is omission to sue in respect of a path of claim by a plaintiff. Order 9, rule 9, where a decree is passed against the plaintiff by default. Order 11, rule 21, clause 2, where a suit is dismissed for non-compliance with an order of discovery. Order 2, Rule 9, where a suit was abated. Order 23, Rule 1, Clause 1, where a suit on the part of a claim has been abandoned by a plaintiff. Order 23, Rule 1, Clause 3, where a suit or a part of a claim has been withdrawn by a plaintiff without the leave of the court. Order 23, Rule 3a, where a compromise decree is sought to be challenged on the ground and the compromise was not lawful. The case is Millis v. Prakash Chamanla for a dis- discussion. Next is foreign judgment. Here the rest of it is complete. Stay of suit included.